Perfect. Oh, she's here. There she is. There she is. All right. Well, 702, we'll start. I hope more people join us. Um, but uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. I'm Dale, Dale Lydon. And uh, I'm going to be your leader tonight. Um, let's go ahead and so the board members that are here, um, I'm just going to go in order of my screen uh, is uh, Jay Sundahl. Speaking. Jay, raise yeah. your hand. Yeah. Diane Hetrick. Hello. And there's Derek. He'll okay. be in in a second. A former board meeting, former board member, Gidget Terpstra. And uh, I guess we could call Dennis your, uh, he was an ex officio board member. <laughs> too, wasn't he? Is, is he off doing trains tonight or is he? No, he's here. Good. And uh, there's Derek, Derek Chrysler. Kressler? Hey there. Chrysler, yeah, there Chrysler. yeah, and uh, and then um, others that uh, Patrick Deegan is uh, someone who has uh, who's a big time volunteer in this neighborhood. Uh, you can see him just about every morning and most afternoons in the uh, Echo Lake Park, uh, patrolling and making sure that things are in good order. You know, we need we need community members like like that. So uh, I guess let's uh, just kind of start the agenda. People are trickling in and I'm glad. I'm gonna start Diane with, um, I'm sorry. Yes, the outreach report. Okay, well, our main outreach is through uh, our email list, which has 443 people on it and our Facebook page, which has 726 people who are following us on Facebook. Uh, naturally, there are more that just haven't, haven't uh, done the official follow. Uh, we also have a wonderful web page, Echo Lake Neighborhood. And if you know anybody who wants to be on the list to be notified, have them send an email to elnaboard at gmail.com or have them go through our webpage, there's a contact form there. We'd like to have all 3,000 people in Echo Lake on our list. We would. That'd be great. And, and it'd be great to have the majority of them in our meeting, too. Yeah, that too. Uh, next, I'm going to go over the treasurer's report. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And I have there we go. I have a the report. Um, we always lag a little bit because because the uh, bank statements are lagging. But uh, statement date uh, through nine twenty two. Uh, we had a beginning balance of fourteen hundred oh nine. And an ending balance of pretty much the same. There are no expenses or contributions or other income this month. And uh, so contributions, you know, we we used to have fairly significant contributions from the book sale and uh, other means uh, that those have kind of gone away as a... Um, as a result of the COVID and uh, and uh, so our contributions are are somewhat uh, somewhat mostly halted. Uh, a few people have generously contributed, a few individuals, and and uh, we always appreciate that. Some of the things that we uh, that we have used our um, our funds for in the past are things that. Uh, would uh, benefit the community and uh, 
you know, we've donated to uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the things um, that the city has done. Uh, I think of the uh, Veterans Plaza. We donated for the Veterans Plaza. Uh, some things like that. We have used funds for uh, create a little free um, a little free library and uh, a nice kiosk for information at our uh, at our Densmore Pathway, which is uh, uh, our unused city right away on uh, that would normally be Densmore Avenue between. Uh, um, I'm sorry, it would be uh, between Densmore and Ashworth. It was actually what was it one one eighty eighth I think. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, one ninety eighth. But uh, so we um, <laughs> we maintain that little trail and we've uh, updated and upgraded and we've added things here and there and little sculptures <laughs> and plantings. <laughs> no, I don't think so. And so, you know, that's the, we're, we also used to contribute to, uh, uh, to books for teachers at Echo Lake Elementary. And uh, we'd like to do that again someday. So, uh, as uh, as funding comes back after the pandemic, so anyway, that's uh, where we are. So our we are at uh, currently at uh, thousand four hundred nine dollars and seventy three cents. So the and if anyone were to have any questions, um, you can certainly put uh, questions in chat for me, and or you can email them to uh, Elma Board. And uh, we would certainly respond. Um, a few more people are showing up. Uh, you see Dana Sundahl. That's uh, she's um, with Jay. She's probably in another part of the house. <laughs> and uh, uh, Natalie Chu is there. Please wave. Uh, oh, Sid and Diane. And uh, Joe Williams, I am not familiar. Hey, it's been a few weeks since I joined. I missed the last few last season. Okay. I, you you had joined and said that you saw the uh, advertisement on one of our uh, one of our boards, right? Uh, yeah, and we got a mailer when we moved into our house, or okay. at least something in our mailbox. Okay. I see Derek making uh, fingers, but now I'm unmuted. Yes. Yeah, that's great. The board. I put one board out, so I don't. I think he must have seen boards in the few in the past, but maybe somebody saw that one board tonight. Yeah. We and, hope. And Joe got the mailer, so that's good. Um, let's see other. Okay. Other items on the agenda. So other meetings. My water. Uh, I'm staying my water. Have, uh, <laughs> any of the board members, have you gone to uh, uh, joined any other meetings lately? Uh, anything in the community? No, I haven't. <clears throat> I've okay. just lost Zoom. All right. <sighs> Our next meeting on uh, November 21st will be led by Derek. And Derek, you want to give us a little bit of a preview of what that meeting will be about? Oh, excellent. Um, well, most people, when I mention my project, talk about goats because goats are definitely what you see when you first show up. But it existed before goats. And that's what I'll talk about is a, is a little bit of the history behind uh, the Seattle uh, City Light property that's uh, along 192nd, North 192nd, and Interurban. And I think everybody should be aware of it. And if they're not, and they happen to just by accident come across my program, they'll find out more than they ever thought they wanted to know. <laughs> Derek, Derek, uh, he, saw, he saw an issue. He saw this uh, piece of property that was overgrown and uh, really in terrible shape. And uh, 
he saw underneath all the brambles and, and blackberries and under the mountains of blackberries, and he saw a park. And uh, that happens to be uh, a city light right away. And just uh, to the south of 192nd along the, the, the in urban trail. And uh, he took that dream and went to uh, went to City Light and found somebody at City Light that said, hey, that's a great idea. And uh, so the goats are, um, of course, feasting on blackberries. And they're the one of uh, nature's greatest blackberry uh, uh, deterrents that we know. And so. That'll be uh, that'll be next next uh, next month, right? Exactly. I'll uh, I'll be working on it. And everybody loves goats. The goats are yeah. Everybody. Come the on. goats are cute. So, um, that's pretty much what I've got for the board meeting. Do we have anything else, uh, board members, others? Well, Jay, do you want to say anything about the trunk or treat? Oh yeah, Jay, you're muted. Sorry, I, yeah, uh, we'll on uh, October twenty eighth in the afternoon, two o'clock. There'll be trunk or treat at Echo Lake uh, Elementary School, and uh, we'll I'll be there with my wife, and we'll be handing out something. We haven't picked that up yet, uh, but. Uh, We'll be doing that for uh, basically elementary school kids in the area, and uh, from two to two to three thirty, I believe, for for the on the board. That's a PTA project, right? That's correct. Yeah, we try to support Echo Lake PTA as much as we can. That's our that it's actually the only school in our neighborhood is Echo Lake Elementary, so we like to make the most of it. <laughs> Yeah, we actually that. signed off for the street closure for that. Yeah. Ah, okay. And uh, yeah, of course, many of us have had kids uh, run through that school. Yeah. So yep. Yep. It's uh, uh, very. I just wanted to ask because I saw my name in reference to a sign in one of the feeds on the Skype page about this trunk or treat that they wanted one of the uh, the uh, uh, Echo Lake neighborhood signs. Is that true? No, yeah. we don't need it. We don't need it. I forgot that they lined all the cars up in a row. They, they back them into the, they've got um, angled parking spaces all along okay. the school. So the sign would the make the, no need for a sign. Excellent. No, because there's, there's no room for it. Excellent news. The first year they did it, they did it in the big parking lot. So it would have been really nice to have a big sign. I don't know what Jay's going to do to identify us. I uh, have to dig through all of those all of those laminated signs we have. But I was thinking the board would be good for that, but not not when they're in those angled parking spaces. So you're off the hook. <laughs> good. Could okay. I, could I say... One thing yeah. in the chat, I see Nate, Nate Lean put a message that she had advertised for Elna in the uh, Blakely, and that's I think I'm I'm really pleased. We need to get we need that's one way to bring in more people, yeah, uh, to our meeting. And she mentioned the planning for the comprehensive plan meeting. Uh, I don't on a, anyway. It's in the chat on October twenty third. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. October twenty third. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to ask who uh, who felt our earthquake uh, a week ago Sunday. It uh, yeah, it was a uh, kind of a funny feeling. We were at uh, uh, in a group with uh, people and kind of in Lake Forest Park, Briar Shoreline area, and uh, felt like somebody was kicking the couch I was sitting on. It was the oddest thing. So it reminded me that. Uh, Thursday, yeah, the 19th is the great shakeout. So uh, it's uh, the state um, has a has a, a shakeout. Um, the city that I work for, the agency I work for, is uh, we've advertised it, and we're all supposed to make sure that we 
drop and get under our desks and, and stuff like that. So uh, just reminds us and gives us a chance to, uh, to practice those skills again. And uh, so it's a surprise on the 19th, sometime around 10. So uh, be surprised. And um, in the past, uh, we have had a contest where we have people take pictures of themselves underneath their desks and send it in. And some of them are funny and things like that. But it's uh, it's a good thing to remember and uh, to make sure that you have your emergency kits together and uh, and all that, because we have no idea when the, the next great shake will happen. And uh, there's a potential for catastrophic and catastrophic damage and uh, not to be a downer, but if we're prepared and if we have our, our stuff together and we know where it is and, and food in the garage and things like that, it's uh, we will all be uh, better prepared. So I just want to encourage you all and remind you. And uh, so I think without any further um, discussion, I don't think we have anything left on our agenda, but to introduce um, our guest tonight, the uh, the uh, uh, ICHS International Community Health Services. Um, incredible story, um, incredible need, and um, it's meeting uh, it's meeting needs. And uh, I was just uh, mentioning that. You know, we were we were kind of uh, waiting on the edge of our seat when we saw the building being built, and uh, Na reminded me that it was ten years ago already. It's like time travel; time happens fast. And so uh, tonight, I'd <clears throat> like to introduce uh, Navo, Health Center Manager for ICHS, and Dana Nunez, Community Access Specialist. And so. I want to welcome you and thank you for coming and give you free reign to, to uh, say whatever you want and um, we'll give you as much time and we've got until at least quarter to nine. So uh, the time is yours. Hey, thank you for having us. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Novel. I'm the health center manager at our ICHS Shoreline Medical and Dental Clinic. Um, I have been with ICHS for 13 years um, and only two years at um, the Shoreline Clinic as a manager. Um, I'll be leaving, uh, leading the presentation today to tell you about ICHS and our Shoreline Clinic. Um, I also have uh, Donna here with us. Um, Donna, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Donna Nunez. I'm the Community Access Specialist for ICHS in Shoreline. Um, I do a lot of community outreach in particular, which I'll be talking a little bit more about later in the presentation. Um, so yeah, please take it away now. Thank you. So who are we? Um, International Community Health Services is a nonprofit community health center providing culturally, linguistically appropriate health and wellness services and promote health equity for all. Our vision statement is healthier people, thriving families, empowered communities, and a just society. Um, in the photo that you see here, this is all of our, our ICHS staff at the Shoreline Clinic. Uh, we have pharmacists, we have providers, behavioral health providers, um, nutritionists, dentists, uh, pharmacists. So we have a range of staffing here um, to, to assist our patients. Um, so since its founding in 1973, ICHS has grown from a single storefront clinic in Seattle's Chinatown International District with deep roots in the Asian Pacific Islander community to a regional healthcare provider employing over 600 people. Um, we have 600 staff and um, 10 clinic locations all over um, the King County area. So we have the Shoreline Medical and Dental Clinic, we have uh, two um, clinics in the school, so Seattle World School and Highland Middle School. We have a clinic in International District, um, one is, uh, and then one in Bellevue Clinic, uh, one in Holly Park Clinic, and we also have uh, ICHS Legacy House 
in a primary care clinic at ACRX and also a mobile dental clinic. Um, we serve patients through uh, all, all um, languages. So um, the top 70 languages that we serve are, are patients speaking Cantonese, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Spanish, Toisanese, um, the list goes on. We, we have uh, staff with um, those languages as well. So we're able to assist patients um, that speak different languages. And we also have interpretation machines um, to do video and also phone interpretations for our patients. So I see the Shoreline Medical and Dental Clinic. Um, this clinic was opened in 2014. And um, ICHS is the first nonprofit community clinic that opened in Shoreline. Our move was our second clinic to be outside of the Seattle region. And uh, from our community needs assessment, uh, we understood that there was a large immigrant and low income populations living in Shore, uh, Shoreline area. So um, there were patients that were underserved by the healthcare system. Um, and so in collaboration with the city of Shoreline and as a part of their plans to revitalize Aurora Avenue, we decided to open a clinic um, at this site. So our funds came from a combination of fundraising and expansion in Medicaid and establishment of the health benefits exchange. Um, and our expansion reflects our emergence as a regional healthcare provider. The Shoreline Clinic um, is 46,000 square foot. Um, our building is a certified LED gold building for our green and environmentally features. We have 18 exam rooms for medical and 20 dental operatories. Uh, we have 10 operatories on the second floor and another 10 on um, the third floor. Um, so the Shoreline Clinic offer adult and pediatric uh, medical care, uh, women's preventative health, medication assisted treatment, nutrition counseling and WIC services. We also have an on-site pharmacy and we also provide comprehensive dental, um, behavior health, um, HIV prevention, health education, and also insurance enrollment. Uh, we have um, an ARMP family nurse practi practitioner residency program here in Shoreline. Um, and we also have an MA and a, a DA apprenticeship program for anyone that um, who wants to be trained as an MA and a DA. And this program, we um, provide paid training and benefits for anyone who's interested. And some numbers um, regarding our Shoreline Clinic, we serve 6,690 patients total in 2022. Um, uh, of those 6,000 patients, 4,800 as medical patients, and we serve 2,900 dental patients and also 360 behavior health patients. Um, our patients, 47% um, of our patients live in Shoreline area, and 27% live outside of King County, and 18% in Seattle, and 6% um, in other King County areas. Uh, we provide a affordable health care services for all. So if patients does not have insurance, we have eligibility specialists who can assist the patients to enroll to Apple Health um, or apply to our sliding scale discount um, based on their income level. Um, we also have a flat fee schedule for um, uninsured patients. So if they qualify or below the 100% federal poverty level, um, they just have to pay a nominal fee of $35 for medical services and $50 for dental. So if they need an exam, cleaning, or extraction, they just pay that uh, nominal fee. And um, COVID-19 response. Um, so during the COVID times, um, we opened up a COVID test site at the Shoreline Clinic. And during the peak of the COVID uh, back in 2020, we were able to perform 5,000 COVID tests for the community. Um, and in January 2021, when um, COVID vaccines were first made available to the public, uh, we vaccinated 3,900 patients um, in the Shoreline community. Uh, we utilized our clinic space so that we could vaccinate um, people of, out in the community. They didn't have to be a patient. Um, they just need to schedule an appointment virtually on, online, um, and they're able to stop by to our clinic to get their vaccines. Um, uh, we are, we're also a distribution site for COVID-19 test kits. So we were able to provide 24,000 test kits um, from 2022 to the present. So anyone can just stop by our doors and ask for test kits, and we can provide them with test kits. We also have other ICHS services. Um, 
We have an assisted living, um, assisted living. We have uh, senior meal programs um, in the heart of Seattle International District. Um, and we also have a program for all-inclusive care for the elderly and adult day services program with transportation to bring elders to our facility in the International District, um, as well as a 24-7 assisted living facility. Um, in addition, we have the Holly Park After Hours Clinic to provide access to our patients when our clinic's uh, sites are closed. And we also have a vision clinic and a Chinese traditional medicine services in our international district where patients can get acupuncture services. Um, and we're also honored to be recognized as a national leader in patient care and advocacy. Um, so we receive awards um, through the years. So the Immunized Washington Award is um, you had to vaccinate um, uh, pediatrics and also adults, 80% um, of your patient population in order to get this award. Um, and we also go through, um, we have the HRSA Health Center Program Award, um, 2023 Advocacy Center of Excellence, and also the uh, number one health center for Medicaid insured patients. Okay, and Donna, you wanna take over this? Hi, um, so again, my name is Donna. I'm a community access specialist. Um, a lot of people may not know what that is. Um, for, for my team, community access specialist is just another name for community health worker. Um, so a lot of my work in particular, um, is, has to do with the community. So I actually don't spend a whole lot of time at the clinic itself, although I am part of the Shoreline Clinic. Um, so in that sense, um, because I am part of Shoreline, um, I focus within the five mile radius of the Shoreline Clinic. So um, any, any surrounding um, CBOs, we call them community-based organizations, or any um, nonprofits in the area, we try to partner with them because we believe it's really important to have more of a holistic approach to um, uh, helping people access whatever resources they may need. It may not necessarily be medical or dental. Sometimes it's something unrelated to health overall, um, but that's um, just something that as ICHS, we just wanted to take part in to be able to help community members access things that they, maybe they don't really know how to access um, on their own. So um, see, uh, now could you please go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so prior, for Shoreline in particular, um, we are not currently doing this, but we are, on, we are interested in starting this again. But prior to the pandemic, um, our team, so the community access team would, um, we, we currently do, table at um, food banks. So for example, I partner with the Hope Link in Shoreline. I go there um, about once a week um, just to be there for a couple hours and see if anyone has any um, questions about health insurance, any questions about other resources or ICHS. Um, but prior to the pandemic, um, whenever we would table at these, um, at these food banks, um, the food banks, uh, would uh, allow us to take a few of the food bags um, to back to the clinic in case any of our clients um, needed uh, to access access uh, or to address their food insecurity issues, uh, but they, for some reason, either due to like, transportation issues or time, um, they just weren't able to head to their nearest food bank. So we would partner with these uh, food banks in order to just try to overcome that obstacle um, I know that Bellevue currently is doing that. Shoreline, due to the pandemic, um, we haven't been able to do that recently, but again, we are trying to get that uh, back in process. Um, as far as affordable housing facilities go, um, we partner with uh, facilities such as the Oaks. Um, they're, they're part of Lake City Partners. They have two, um, two main facilities, one in Lake City, and then one that's um, quite literally a two minute walk from our clinic um, on Aurora. Um, so these facilities just um, help people um, access, help um, unhoused people, I'm sorry, uh, access resources, the Oaks in particular, it's a facility which I believe they house around 60 people. Um, it's more of a permanent housing 
facility. Um, so I table there every two weeks for three hours. Um, and similar to when I table at Hope Link Shoreline, I am just there for a few hours to help answer any questions. But um, each each organization that I go to, uh, for in, in this case, the Oaks versus Hope Link, they all have different um, different things that they're looking for. For example, when I go to the Oaks, uh, most of my most of the questions that I receive there are about health insurance. Um, whereas where I go, whenever I go to Hope Link, um, a lot of people are interested in ICHS in particular. But um, those are just some of the organizations we partner with and some of the programs that we work with. And then as far as early childhood and healthy start programs, uh, we do work with a couple of grants. Um, in this case in particular, it's with, um, I believe it's called Working, working Connections. Um, it's for, it's a program that just helps um, advocate for uh, cost-effective or affordable daycare options. Um, so whenever we're just out doing tabling, that's one of the flyers that we have in case any families um, are interested in accessing daycare that maybe they didn't know that they had access to. Um, and then there's a video, or sorry, a, a photo of my team and I at um, at an event in, I believe it is South Seattle. It was for um, Dia de las Familias. It was a Hispanic event um, just to promote uh, healthy healthy living within families. Um, but we were there to um, provide provide COVID vaccines. That's another thing that we do. We tend to do pop up clinics, uh, pop up COVID clinics, um, uh, whichever organization that requests it, just in case they need any COVID vaccines. We can also sometimes do other vaccines as well, such as like the flu, or a few months ago, we organized one at our clinic with um, the Shoreline School District for pediatric vaccines, which was a huge success, uh, I think. Um, and uh, we were able to vaccinate, I believe, 50, 50 families, uh, and get a few, around a little bit uh, over 20 or 30 for the COVID vaccine. But yeah, those are just some of the programs we work with. Uh, Not could you please get to the next one? Thank you. Um, so senior service programs, um, uh, those are very similar to the ones that are very similar to the the legacy house that we have in the international district in the sense of um, they are, they promote the same thing, which is just a supportive family-like community. Um, but whenever my team tables at organizations, um, we are there just to help promote healthy eating and active living. Uh, we, we usually try to, uh, whenever we table at an organization, we try to, um, bring information or do outreach on whatever that particular organization may be in need of. As I mentioned earlier, with the Hope Link, um, sometimes they request certain resources. And then for civic engagement programs and registration. Um, so in the past, um, not so much this year because we're working with a little bit of a different grant, um, but in the past we've definitely taken part in helping encourage voter registration. We would attend um, we would attend forums and take part in organizing events, especially in the international district area, um, Shoreline. Uh, I believe there were a few events that we attended as well, although um, Seattle seemed like they, they had a, a few more events. Um, now, could you please get to the next slide? Thank you. So for the mobile dental clinic. Um, so the mobile dental clinic is, um, they're just, um, they're, sorry, they're like a mobile dental uh, option. So they go from school to school. They're usually based at our um, Seattle, at the Seattle World School. Um, and they um, go, so we're partnered with um, the Seattle School District or the Seattle World School and any surrounding schools in that area, I believe. And then in Bellevue, um, the entire Bellevue School District. So these mobile dental clinics, they go to those school districts and they just provide services for the children free of charge. Um, 
throughout the year. Shoreline currently does not do this, but that is something that I've heard that we're interested in doing eventually. Um, so some of the services that they do offer are cleaning, exams, x-rays, fillings, extractions, um, sealants, fluoride treatments, emergency examinations, and palliative treatments. Um, and then there are a few more, but for the most part, this is it. Um, now, next slide, please. Okay, so it's, these are, these organizations are just some of the ones that we partner with. Um, so food banks, we've talked uh, talked a little bit about that. Um, same with affordable housing facilities and the early childhood. Um, yeah, for the most part, each, um, each clinic has different surrounding organizations that we partner with. For example, uh, since I'm in the Shoreline area, I partner with, for example, the Dale Turner Family YMCA or Hope Link or the Oaks or even organizations that are further from the five mile radius. Uh, the five mi mile radius isn't something that is very um, hard set, I guess I should say. Um, so although we do try to stick within the five mile radius, if we see that there's an organization that is requesting uh, resources or they need help with anything such as um, health insurance enrollment, uh, we can definitely partner with them. For example, the Latino Education Training Institute, they're technically in Snohomish County, um, but I table there once a month because we've noticed that there's a need over there that maybe they're not able to access through um, that easily in Snohomish County. So we make it a priority to partner with community, community-based organizations. Um, now, next slide, please. So advocacy, um, our advocacy looks a little, uh, there are different ways in which we advocate. Uh, for example, this month, um, it's about to be open enrollment. So one of the ways that we take part in advocacy is to um, stay up to date with anything that has to do with um, federally qualified health centers. So for example, um, health insurance enrollment, um, it's, there's gonna be an expansion on the, on how it works. So starting this open enrollment in 2024, it's gonna be open to undocumented people. Um, so they will be able to purchase um, health insurance. And then in July, 2024, they'll be able to qualify under Apple Hub. So one way that we try to um, try to take part in advocacy again is to be knowledgeable and learn more about it what it is that we can do we also partner with NUSA uh, which you guys might be familiar with um, we attend their forums and um, we try to take part in whatever uh, we can just so that we know how to best um, serve our community members now next slide please and then our impact, um, I think Nod touched on that a little bit earlier about Shoreline. Um, next slide, please. Any questions? Natalie. Hi, did you have a question? Hi, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I love your presentation and I love all the services that you give. I was curious, um, you did mention for your funding, you get grants. Um, and I was wondering, um, are those grants from um, City of Shoreline? Are, are they from King County? Um, are they national grants? I was just curious. Um, as far as I know, and now I might have a better idea of this, um, I believe they are all three. So we have grants from Shoreline, we have grants from King County and then federal grants. Um, and then we also do do fundraisers as well. Thank you. Now, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, we get grants from Public Health and um, King County grants um, to help with our services. Um, yeah, and, and then we have like different grants um, to help with like our ARMP residency. We have a grant for that or like our HIV prevention. We have uh, another grant to help uh, sponsor those programs that we have. Dale, did you have do you do research? Oh, sorry. Sorry. 
I was just curious about do do you get research grants? Do you do any research there, like on like clinical types of research? I think we do have one currently. We're doing um, one regarding TB tuber uh, tuberculosis, um, and I think we're partnering partnering with. Public health. Mm -hmm. uh, How do I put my hand up? Like, oh, damn. Yeah. Thank you. So I had a question uh, regarding assisted living. Is that the Legacy House? Is that what the assisted yeah. living is? Yeah, so Legacy House in International. One of these was. And that. is that, um, I guess I've had some experience with uh, assisted living. Does is, is that take Medicaid or is that uh, still, is all that all private uh, uh, with donations? And how does that work? Um, I think that for me, we're, we're not, I'm not sure. Um, I don't have that much detail regarding the program, um, but I know that um, there are a set of criteria um, that the patients need to um, qualify for in order to um, be able to enroll to the program. But I can forward you more information uh, from the program administrator. Okay. Yeah, it was, in, yeah, it was kind of a, just a, a thought I was kind of wondering about. I, that was something that I wasn't aware of. Um, and you said your uh, your dental your mobile dental clinic that goes primarily to schools. Does it go to other other locations, other places, community uh, centers, things like that? Uh, not at that this moment. It's mainly for schools. Okay. Thank you. Could you and then did you get yes. some questions? Um, I used to work for the Shoreline School District. And I was wondering if you had met with, with all the family advocates and counselors at the schools. Um, you have wonderful services. And, and when I worked at the um, school, um, there were many families, if I had known about your services, that I could have referred them to. But to get the word out and, and have people um, know about you is really critical. So I was just curious whether you have been able to meet with all the family advocates. Um, I actually have not have not had many chances to meet with most of the family advocates. My main contact for the Shoreline School District has been Rachel Brucker. She is the head nurse, I believe, for the entire Shoreline School District. So she has sent me a few referrals for families that might need um, services like medical services or health insurance services um but if you happen to have any contacts that you could please for it to me that'd be great I'd love to meet more people all right um can you put in the chat how to contact you yeah, of course thank yeah. you and, and i'm surprised that uh, that sh um, your contact wouldn't uh, be able or wouldn't put you into contact with you know there every elementary school in this district has um, has a nurse a school nurse and uh, there are some very strong family advocates and you know that's absolutely gets it's absolutely right there's people that are in critical need of your services that may not be hearing about them yeah and it could be because you know for uh, donna and i are pretty new to shoreline and like i've only been at shoreline clinic for two years so maybe there was already uh, you know a relationship established with previous managers um, but for now, um, Donna and I has only worked with uh, Rachel um, to do an event to vaccinate children um, so that they can go back to school. So we did that event um, early this fall. Good. Well, one of the things I, one of the strengths I think of our neighborhood association in the past has been our, our connection with schools. And, and uh, so you know, Gidget, of course, has been a fantastic uh, uh, connection and and others of us too that you know, we we have those connections through the school systems and so yeah. yeah I think that's great especially right now we're trying to expand and to get more pediatrics into our clinics um, like I mentioned before we have uh, a second floor and a third floor dental right now and we're trying to expand and get more patients in and we're trying to uh, advocate to get more uh, more pediatric patients. I, I don't want to speak for the board, but I know for myself, I you know we're certainly we're certainly willing. Our 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 charter is really to create bridges and to create connections between um, you know our our community, our schools, our businesses, and um, so that's that's one of the reasons that uh, you know, we exist. 
Yeah, and Dale, you have my contact info. So if you know anyone that, you know, would like to connect or have a tour of our clinic site um, to learn more about services, you know, feel free to uh, send out my information. Okay. Excuse me, you said that you, uh, you, you have connections with NUSHA. Do you table at the community court? At the community court for the Shoreline City Hall? Yes. Yes, okay, good. That's one. And what about the senior center? Have you made contact with the senior center? I've reached out to them a few times and unfortunately haven't heard back, but it's possible that maybe that person I reached out to just isn't working there anymore. But yeah, I remember um, getting some contacts off of SUNY um, a year ago. So again, yeah, that person may not be working there. Okay. Yeah, see, those are some things I think maybe we can help you with. Yeah, we will. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Please. And did you say that your dental, your mobile dental clinic has not been to the two high schools? The mobile dental clinic, unfortunately, at this time is only limited to the Seattle World School and the Belby School District. Oh. Hmm. Well, is that something you might consider? Yes, we definitely love to. Um, I I just know that it's a bit of a process which takes a few years. Um, now, have you heard more about how, from Jenny about how this could uh, work in Shoreline? Yeah, I, I think I have to follow up to see, because I thought we did have some partnership with Shorecrest and Shorewood High School, um, but yeah, we can follow up. I know we go to like the schools to provide kids with education on like young adult clinics and, you know, um, um, yeah, the health education and all of that. Um, um, to the students and the high school. So we do have some kind of partnership, but um, probably have to follow up regarding dental, the mobile dental. Okay. Natalie, did you have a question? I did. I heard um, there was paid training and benefits, MA and VA training. I wasn't sure what that was. I, I Can you clarify? I'm not familiar with those terms. Yeah, so um, so we're looking to hire or recruit more dental assistants and also medical assistants. So we have uh, medical and dental assistant programs here where we provide the training, um, um, the schooling, we pay for everything. And, um, you know, the student can learn from us hands on learning and also online learning, and they'll be able to also get paid at the same time. Um, and once they're done with their program, um, they have to work with us for at least two years. Um, but at least it's a, a good learning opportunity. Um, how can people find out more information about that? Would they talk to you or is it on your website? It's on our website. We do have uh, information regarding our dental assistant and medical assistant program. Um, and we're also pretty short staffed right now with medical assistants and uh, dental assistants. So if you know anyone, <laughs> send them our way. I believe Thank it's you. listed in the career openings tab. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, um, you can just direct them there. Nice. Thank you. Patrick, did you have a question? I did. I, you're, uh, you mentioned the mobile dental clinic, but that, that is just a part of it. You also do have on-site dental services. That's right. Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Where students could come to. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I was going to follow up that the, um, the positions that you're hiring for, are, are those full-time or are they part-time or, or both or full time at this at this moment it's full time. Okay. Did anyone have any more questions? What kind of ways would you like to expand into the community? I'm sorry, could you please repeat that? Do you have some particular goals for the way you would like to expand further in, into the Shoreline community? Um, particular goals, um, it would definitely be wonderful if I could meet more of the surrounding CBOs. Uh, for, like you guys mentioned, the, the Senior Center, um, I'd really like to make contact with them. Um, are any, any community-based centers um, like the Spartan gym, I think that'd be a really great one. Um, but 
they see a lot of people, so understandably, it's a little bit harder to reach out to them. Um, or just um, another way I'd really like to um, connect with the Shoreline School District or just Shoreline in general is any um, any services or any organizations that um, help immigrant communities, for example, since we, we do see a lot of immigrant families. Um, but the only way we've been able to reach them, at least on my end, has been through the Shoreline School District. Would you like to um, table at more events, like all the Shoreline events? Like there was a Shoreline um, City celebration on the 19th of, I think, September. It's a big event and there were a lot of tables. Did you have a table there or was it? Yeah, so we usually do attend that one. Um, unfortunately, this year I wasn't able to make it since I had a different event um, up in Bellevue. So, but next year we, I think, we'll for sure be there. Yeah, the Shoreline PTA Council might be a good contact for you too. They um, <clears throat> they provide a lot of services through their clothing room, which is called the Works. It seems like, um, seems like, yeah, that's something we can connect you with. And the Rotaries are pretty active here too. I don't know of any, any immigrant groups. That's, those are kind of hard to come by. Um, but yeah, yeah everybody's PTA group is holding, something. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry, Natalie. The PTA groups is holding a um, mental health clinic or it's a free event for community on the 25th of this month. And I signed up. It's in the evening. I believe it's in the evening. Um, just curious to see what they would present. But um, yeah, there's all kinds of, and that would be a great event for you, maybe table as well, um, a mental health clinic, because I'm sure you have services. Um, I guess. That's through the PTA. It's a panel discussion. I'm not sure that they're going to have oh. uh, tables there, but it's it's a new committee of the Shoreline PTA Council for the mental health. And yeah, it's, you're doing things like that too. That seems like a really great connection. And we can do that for you too. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, there's um, a lot of things. I'm, I'm... Yeah, there's a lot of, there are a lot of community organizations that it sounds like you would have, have um, it would be good contacts and we'll see what we can do to get those contacts to you and you to them. I mean, to have, have a wonderful organization like yours with all of your services and then all of these other organizations, I, I, piecemeal is not a good way to go. No. Net, networking, networking. It's all about networking. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Did we forget anybody? So you were talking at one point before the pandemic about doing a high school clinic. Is that one still still on the, the planning list? Um, so I think um, prior to the pandemic, we did a young adult clinic um, where students can just drop by the clinic and, you know, they get to see a provider. Um, but after the pandemic, you know, we just didn't have the capacity to do that at this time. However, students um, can still schedule with us uh, to see a provider. It's just that it's not a drop-in basis. It's they have to schedule an appointment to see the provider. Um, but we can still serve um, um, kids for confidential visits. Yeah, because you're within walking distance of Shorewood High School. Yeah. A little more difficult for the other side of the district, but... And you're actually not all that far from King's, uh, which is a private high school. It's hard for kids. Yeah. Well, don't all speak at once. <laughs> Well, the things you're doing are so wonderful and it's so comprehensive. I mean, just to have dental services is amazing because that's one of the things that very often is left out when there's when there's medical services. I mean, like I think about, uh, you know, they talk about the wonderful health system in the British Isles, but Ireland, everybody has bad teeth. 
because they don't have dental services. So it's just kind of incredible that you guys do that. And I, I believe that you had made uh, some sort of contact with the college, with Shoreline Community College. Am I wrong about that? They yes. have a Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, now is there something you wanted to? Yes, I was gonna say we did contact with the Shoreline Community College. They had a tour with our clinics and we provided them information um, and that they can refer patients to us. Um, you know, patients that are uninsured, we can, you know, serve them here. So we did make that connection recently. Yeah, and I, I table there once a month. I table with um, Omar, who's part of our HIV department. Um, yeah, we're just there in the lobby if anyone happens to stop by. Great. Yeah, that's a good contact. And and of course, those are kids, a huge number of kids that are not from Shoreline that go there. So they're away from home. They don't have they don't have family support or so it's wonderful that you have made that contact with the college. They're a pretty good resource too. Gidget, what have I forgotten? <laughs> you know everything. I've got a list of organizations. Haven't forgotten anybody? <laughs> okay. I was thinking maybe Seattle Housing Authority or so, do you work with that? Uh, I, I, maybe I'm, Maybe I'm making an error here, but right across from Costco is the the Lake House, which is a uh, I think is owned by Seattle Housing Authority, and I see many immigrant or many uh, many Asian families in that in that particular house, but I, in that what do you call it, complex? But I, I don't know if you go to individual um, buildings or communities or not. But the Lake House might might be interested in, in the ones that I know speak Korean. I have a little trouble speaking with them other than to smile and say good morning. You know? But but your your facility with languages is is your availability of languages is really neat. I think I think that's uh oh shoot, who is Lake House? Well we've we do have the King County Housing Authority. We have yes, the, yes that's what that's what I meant. King County Housing yeah. Authority. Yeah. Yeah, and then Compass Center is the Veterans Center. Yes, yes, that's the Veterans Center. So they, they would, they have. Do they have their own services that you know of, Compass? I, I don't know. I know. I know a number that go to the VA, but I, I don't know. I think they, I, oh, I don't know right. if they they've, have, they've got I access don't know to if the they VA. have their own services. Yeah, Compass would. That's right. The veterans could, would have the services of the VA. Um, and now we've got a new low income low income housing building on 198th, 198th. Yes. yes. And I don't know what kind of medical services they have. Is that Catholic community services? Yes, I think so. Uh, well, that was for the counseling. I don't know if they provide any medical. And they're right on Aurora, just up the street from you. There's, we have a lot of... Um, we have a lot of assisted living kind of places. Um, or transitional housing. Yeah. Has that one opened up yet? Um, it, it says it, it's expected to open in fall 2023. I, I remember hearing about it, but I wasn't sure if it had opened yet. I know it's built, and I've been having trouble connecting with my person who, who was working with it from the city. So I, I'll find out. I thought they had started moving them in, but I... I can't swear to that, but it sounds like you're keeping tabs on that. Yeah, a little bit, but yeah. that, that's a great reminder, actually. Thank you. Uh, yeah, me too. Follow up on those people. I know they had everybody ready to move in because they were going to move them from another location. Do you guys happen to know anything about Camp United? Um, I There wasn't much information on their website, but I reached out to them. They told me that they're going to be moving back to Shoreline um, in November November 1st. They move every three months. Oh. I, I have contacts with them if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, that'd be great, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we don't seem to have Tent City 3 anymore, but Camp United We Stand is a, is a regular 
regular inhabitant here and they've been very active. Okay. Okay. Anybody else you want? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we make connections. Uh, the Spartan Center is <clears throat> part of the Shoreline Parks Department, Parks and Recreation, by the way. Right. But it would be a good place to set up. There's a football game on Friday that would be a good way to connect people. <laughs> The Rotary Cup, hundreds of people going to watch the two high schools play football with each other. And all every Rotary member within sight will be there too. <laughs> That's right. I, uh, I actually attended Shorewood. Or I've attended, um, I, I've lived in Shoreline my entire life. So I have good memories of the Rotary Cup actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which high school did you graduate from? Uh, Sherwood. Sherwood, yeah. So you know quite a few things about the community, but from a student viewpoint, yeah. Well, that's neat that you're able to work here in your own community. Yeah, yeah. That's a big reason why um, I was so happy when I started working at the, the Shoreline Clinic, because I, I had already known so much about the city that I think it helped me a little bit with my outreach, especially in the beginning. Oh, I'm sure. Were there any other questions? Yeah, no, going once, going twice, <laughs> questions? Do you plan to expand? Are you going to add another couple floors to your building or add another building on or anything like that? <laughs> Not at the moment. Uh, we're, we had already expanded to the third floor for dental, but um, due to staffing at the moment, we're not able to um, utilize it to full capacity yet. So we're only opening on the third floor every Monday, just so we get equipment's running and things don't, you know, uh, break down on us that we're just yeah. sitting there. Um, but we're hoping to hire more dental assistants and hire more dentists so that we could fully utilize the second and the third floor. Are you using all, it, so the, you've got three floors, right? That's it. So the, you're using part of the third floor. Yes. So yeah. you, can, you can keep growing there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. And you have full service, right? You've got x-ray and, and uh, laboratories and... We have laboratory. We partner with LabCorp uh, for oh, lab yeah. services. Uh, we don't do x-rays. We refer patients out for x-rays. But we do um, partner with um, Fred Hutch and um, Swedish for a mobile mammogram. So patients oh. can come to Shoreline, our clinic, to do a mammogram. Good. Okay. The van is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but right now I think um, we're just very short of medical assistance and dental assistance. So uh, if we're able to fill, then we'll, you know, we'll be able to serve more patients. So if you know anybody, please re refer them to us. We will. Yeah. For some reason, it's just pretty hard to hire for um, staffing in Shoreline. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's pretty difficult compared to our other locations, like in Seattle. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. I want to put in a plug here. I, I want to go. I want to, uh, the, I need a partner in my restroom uh, program. <laughs> I, I'm I'm working for a restroom at uh, at uh, the transit center, and Metro says they're going to do it in November. And uh, I just I you know when I was eighteen, I uh, 
you know, when I was 22, I applied to medical school, but I was I was turned down. So I can't go. But as a uh, but I feel that my work working for restrooms is right in line with community health and what I what I feel, have a passion to do. <laughs> and so I I I'm I, I know you're interested in that, too. And uh, there's been a campaign on Seattle and Sunday. The Seattle Times had two large articles on restrooms and Monday they had articles right. on restrooms and today they had an editorial on the importance of public restrooms so i i feel we're really moving uh i think shoreline's going to be a pioneer if metro comes through on this they will be the very first restroom that metro transit has done in their whole system uh and and i really want it to work and that's what i'm worried about now is i think they'll probably do it but i really want it to work so i i uh, uh i i kind of want to I'm so happy to hear you're working on health. I think we got something to share, <laughs> but that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If you if you <laughs> if you don't get it from his from his uh, manner and and uh, presentation, he is a tireless advocate for public restrooms. <laughs> and, and and the and the the last meeting. October 9, the city council, they had represented, I don't know if anyone watched that from Community Transit, and they talked about their improvements at Aurora Village and at the 185th station. And the mayor, the mayor after their presentation says, what do you think, what's your plans on restrooms? <laughs> and, and, mm -hmm. and I was, uh, you know, that's what I would have done if I, and with Mayor Scully, and they said, well, uh, we're not working on that. That's not in our portfolio. And <clears throat> King County owns that land. And 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 Mayor Scully says, well, our problem is it's not in anyone's portfolio. It, uh, you know, nobody wants to say that's there. Uh, so that that was another push for me to brighten up my to give me a little bit of hope that things are going to change. We're, we're going to change our culture and provide restrooms so that more people can be outside when. That's all. Thank you. I'll try to be, I'll mute myself now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pat. So do you have anything else that you, that you want us to know, or do you have questions of us? Um, no questions, but you know, if, if, if anyone's interested in a tour of our facility, you can reach out and, um, you know, <laughs> I'm uh, more than happy to provide a tour. Right. Or if you guys happen to know of any um, families that might need help with like Spanish translations or um, just um, Hispanic immigrant families in particular, because I work a lot with them and I speak Spanish, um, please just let me know. And I, especially with this upcoming open enrollment um, that is expanded for undocumented families. Uh, yes, yeah, please refer them my way. Okay. Certainly. Do you have posters about your open enrollment? Because I could post them at my uh, my building. It's um, I live in a 55 year old older building called the Blakely. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Yes, we do. Um, sorry, please give me one second, and I'll post them in the in the chat. Oh great, thank you. Um. All right. Well, thank you. I. I don't want you to cut you short, but but we certainly appreciate your message. We certainly appreciate your organization. Um, we certainly want to uh, be a part of what you're doing. And uh, you know, again, that's uh, it's kind of our reason for being here is to create connections between people and businesses and the government. And so uh, um, we try to do that whenever we can. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. And um, just feel free to share my uh, contact information with everyone and anyone who's interested in tour, just feel free to email me and we can arrange for something. Okay, certainly will. And we'll, uh, we'll send it out with the minutes of the meeting and things like that too. And we can put it in the chat. Um, so I don't have anything else tonight. Um, again, encourage people to uh, participate in the great shakeout, uh, participate in um, 
things to get to know your neighbors. And once, uh, once the uh, the great earthquake hits, um, we're all going to be on our own, and it'd be a lot better to be on our own with each other than to be on our own. So, uh, just my encouragement of that. Does anyone, anybody in the audience, do we have uh, anything else that you have questions, you have comments? Uh, I was curious if there's a in Shoreline, this um, certified emergency response training. Um, it's kind of where citizens get trained so that if a really big one hits, um, people know what to do. Like they teach you how to like, um, you know, a small person like me would know how to take, um, get a person out from under debris. Um, mm -hmm. They teach us those things and how to put out fires um, because when it hits, the emergency response teams are not going to, there's not going to be enough people to really help. So um, I don't know if we have that type of training here in Shoreline, but that's, I've been through two different trainings in other cities. We have a and group. It was great. Yeah, we have a group, Natalie, and they seem to be moving closer and closer to the uh, NEMCO, which is the North Shore group for uh, Lake Forest Park and Kenmore. So yeah, and they do trainings and shoreline residents are welcome at those trainings. Uh, and one of the things about the Great Shakeout is they're going to sound the tsunami alarm as part of that, mm -hmm. but I don't think anybody can hear it. So I, I've, I've been told that there is an alarm, it's over by Hamlin Park. So, and, and we aren't even close to Hamlin Park, but <laughs> Keep your keep open your windows at ten o'clock. I want to know if anybody hears anything. And actually, we can get tsunamis here, you know. Not uh, not so much. I checked. I'm three hundred feet above sea level. <laughs> but uh, but uh, if there's a, an earthquake in, on the floor of Puget Sound, it would push water up into Lake Forest Park, and right. that would be the end of Lake Forest Park town center and Brookside Elementary. And let's see, there was another low spot. Uh, you know, Harbor Island's gone. All, all of the low lying areas in Puget Sound would be swamped in, any, in a seafloor upthrust earthquake. Yeah. Well, and if it comes into the, you know, if it comes into the, um, into the lake, uh, great parts of Bellevue and Kirkland will be inundated too. Yeah, Medina's a goner. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how far they project the water would go in case of a tsunami, a Puget Sound tsunami. And that yeah. has nothing to do with anything that happens in the ocean or on the, on the coast. Oh, that's a cheerful thought, isn't it? But I just want to know if anybody hears the alarm. Right. Every Everybody listen at 10, 10 a.m. Yeah. Okay, so we will we will we will make those contacts for you, and send them to you, Dana, and um, just see what can happen because you're such a wonderful organization, and it would be really nice to have everybody working together. That'd be great. Thank you so much, and all right. thank you all for um, just um, inviting us and allowing us to give a little presentation for you all. Yeah. Well, we think you're wonderful. We're happy to have you in our town. <laughs> Thank you. And um, uh, I was going to say, too, you know, you are always welcome. If you have appeals and things like that, you know, we have our time in our, our business meeting. You know, where we uh, have allow people to speak. And so, you know, if you ever have something that you want us to know and uh, you want to spend 10 minutes, uh, please let us know. Perfect. Thank uh, you. you can, Absolutely. Always respond to uh, Elna Board, and yeah. uh, we'll get that message. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, same with Na, I actually need to hop off, um, but my contact information is at the top, or I can write it down again if you, if anyone needs it. But um, yeah, again, thank you so much. It's really been great to learn more about you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I think um, it's a little early, but uh, if we don't have anything else, 
think we can probably adjourn the meeting. Board members, do we have anything? Just that I want to get all the information off the chat before we close out. Uh, Jay, how do we copy that? I know there's a way to copy the transcript of the chat. I just can't remember how to do it. Well, I can, I can grab it for you. That'd be great. Uh, there's a report that comes out in the end, but I'll take a... Diane and Sid, are you up to anything you want to tell us about? You usually are. Well, I, I wanted to say one thing that if when we were talking about the the earthquake uh, preparedness topic, we were one of the people that decided to to uh, get our uh, house strapped down to the foundation. Mm -hmm. So if that is ever a topic for a future meeting, uh, we could participate in that. Well, that's a good idea. Great idea. Because people don't realize that that most houses are not strapped to the foundation and um, uh, the right kind of earthquake in your house can be off the foundation and that gets pretty pricey. Yeah, the, when I was talking to the to the company that, that did the work, we I, I said, well, you know, most people protect themselves by buying earthquake insurance. I mean, if you're concerned about earthquakes, you know, buying earthquake insurance. And he said, well, that's true, but, um, you know, good good luck fixing your house or finding a contractor to fix your house along with the hundreds or thousands of other houses that are going to be needing work. Right. You know, so the insurance sounds good, but when you really need your house to be habitable, um, it's not going to help you. Good point. So uh, that's yeah. one reason why I kind of got sold on spending the money to, to do it. So... Well, I'm sure every civil engineer would do that, right? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, if ours holds up and anybody else doesn't, you can come over, okay? <laughs> that, that was the other thing. Now that we've done it, it's kind of like washing your car, right? It, it's like now that we've done it, we're not going to have an earthquake. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. <laughs> so Sid and Diane. Can you share a approximate cost of what it was to have that done to your house? Um, I want to I want to say it was like five or six thousand dollars, something like that. Oh, that's a lot. Um, yeah, it's a big project. I, well, let me. I don't. I could. I could I, look it up. It. It. It's. We. We had it done during COVID. Um, so I'm kind of forgetting. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a huge fortune, but it wasn't. It was like more than a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, um, that's the guy, the, guy was under, the guy was under the house for the better part of a week doing. Oh wow! Doing oh yeah, work. Um, and uh, um, uh, the company we used was called Sound Seismic. And actually, they, they they had a table at those that that event that the city had a few months ago. <laughs> they had like three nights where they were doing home uh, home improvement. Yes, you know, yes. Vendors. And so yeah. that, that that company was actually there for for at least two of those nights. That's that's pretty cheap insurance, though. <laughs> yeah, we just we just decided to do it. And I guess all I wanted to say is that if if it's if it's a topic of interest, you know, we've we've done we we did it a couple of years ago. Yeah, we're we're talking about future topics and uh all that yeah, let's put that on the list and see how it uh how it shakes out. So to speak. Uh -huh. so to speak. <laughs> I, am, I suppose I'm one if you tell your insurance company, you probably get a break for your insurance too, right? I, I think I did. I, I can't remember if I did. Um, but Larry, actually, the if I can kind of put you on the spot, I, I, I was hoping a future topic could be you talking about your uh, solar project and your that whole process and your journey to get that installed on your roof, <clears throat> um, if you're interested. I, I would be interested in hearing it. 
yeah. and your $14 electric bill. I'm really interested in that. $14.41. <laughs> oh, and, don't forget. It had been running about two fifty, dollars So that's about a 10-year payback on just the, in general about what the electric costs were compared to what the uh, solar panel cost is. So mm -hmm. pretty good payback. Yeah, you have some. Yeah, we we do have we have solar panels on our roof, but I love that you wanted him to do that. Yeah, well, we yeah we have them, but I'm I'm interested in what what the current environment is in terms of the economics and the, where the current uh, technology is. I mean, our our panels are, I think they're about seven years old or so. So that's it's almost like ancient, you know. So I can I can just give you a really brief right now if you want. Is that okay with the everybody? I mean, that's, I don't think it's something that that maybe the uh, general public would want to hear about until maybe it gets a little more prevalent that people want to make that change. But uh, like you said, you had panels six or seven years ago. My neighbor that I got the referral from had panels just five years ago, and his panels each. Each one generated um, 370 watts of power. And that's probably what yours, ball, ball, ballpark, what yours might have been. And, and he had a central inverter system as opposed to what I have is micro inverters on each panel. Hmm. That's the progress in the development of these panels. And, and so my panels generate 410 watts of power each. Wow. Uh, as opposed to 370 that was five years ago. So that's a pretty good percentage increase in just technology. And the central inverter uh, system, when that goes down, if it goes down, that takes out all of your panels. It doesn't let them uh, generate the power that goes back into the city light uh, service area. Uh, in the micro inverter system, like I have, each panel has its own micro inverter. So if one panel goes out, that's all it goes out. The rest of it still generates the power <clears throat> and you get credit for that. So I haven't had anything go out yet, except I haven't been trained on the uh, on the system of monitoring, and I don't have it on my phone yet. Eventually, I'll I'll have that training um, where the system will send me a a signal if one of the panels goes out, or if they all go out, or if one of them breaks and and it doesn't generate anymore. It'll tell me that, and I can just call the company, and they'll come out and fix it. So in general, that's the ballpark of what the difference is between five or six years ago and now. Um, so, so Larry, I had a question. Um, do you own or do you rent that system or lease that system? No, I own. Okay, yeah, because I've heard, heard about le people have been leasing solar arrays and then finding issues with that. Yeah. That, yeah I, then, then, anything, I never got into that, so I don't know right. anything about that. But okay, but, yeah, uh, I, I, it was a, it was a, I always thought it was you know private ownership, but then I I started hearing about people who had been leasing their systems, and then their system starts to break down, and the company they leased it from doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, that was so. One so that, that's a whole other no, a whole other you know. Issue, that was but, yeah. one of the factors that I used to make my choice in companies uh, because they were, the, I had three bids and they were all not very far apart, but I just connected with this, this company and, uh, and uh, I liked the way they presented. I liked the fact that they were a national company and they've mm -hmm. been in existence for a long time. And this, this is the Northwest division of that company. And so that added some security to that exact thought that you had. Uh, you know, they guarantee them for a certain 
amount of time. And I know one other thing that was a real big factor, the, uh, the panels that you got, Sid, are probably guaranteed for 20 years. I, if I remember right, that's a ballpark. And that's what uh, my neighbors were, they were guaranteed for 20 years. They didn't guarantee mine for more than 35 years, but they said they should probably last 50. <laughs> and that's the and that's the because of the Northwest uh, climate is not as severe as like if in Texas or in the Midwest or when you have severe winters and severe summers. So the panels don't take as much of a beating, but they were also made in Bellingham as opposed to all the other companies panels were made in, uh, I think it was, one was Taiwan and one was China. Right. So those were all factors that I put together in the piece of pie and made my decision based on, on all of those factors. But uh, you should have seen the neighbor's jaw drop when I told him that my panels were guaranteed almost twice as long as what his were in just five years. So they've made a lot of progress, and I suppose they'll continue to do that over the years. Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I have a question. What about the battery technology? I know that that's a really important aspect of um, solar panels. And um, at one time they said that the battery technology has not improved very much, but I'm hoping that there's now more improvements for better capacity. I did not do any battery backup because we don't lose power enough to justify that here. Um, I suppose if we, you know, had a big earthquake or a major national disaster of some sort, that might be more of a concern. But um, I guess I'm just not that concerned about that aspect of the solar panels uh, and and storaging uh, the battery. So I never really got into a discussion on that. Yeah. Um, I'm also um, kind of curious about solar because of the. Um the 2030 um, date of where um, only electric cars will be sold. And then there's a 2035 date of when um, gasoline will no longer be sold for vehicles. So that it's kind of moving people onto, so onto electric cars. And I don't know if there's as much planning as there should be regarding um, energy infrastructure. Um, where do people charge their cars? Cause it takes, my car takes five hours to charge to go 25 miles, it's a hybrid. But I know Teslas take about two hours, maybe. I mean, where are people going to plug in? They don't have, if they are renters, there's not enough capacity in terms of people plugging in. And I, I mentioned that to the planners and I said, well, these new buildings, they have like 10%, 10% of the, you know, parking spaces have electric plug-ins or someplace or, you know, chargers, but what's gonna happen when that, those dates hit and people are moving more towards electric vehicles. So I think people need to start, I mentioned it, but to the planners, but I, you know, I think it, I, I think because I'm not really an, an engineer of it. I mean, I was an engineering, but I'm not an official engineer. I don't know if anyone's taking it seriously. <laughs> well, they're, gonna have to get, they're gonna have to get serious about it because the, that uh, 2035 target is not going to work if they aren't serious about it. <laughs> but yeah. that's one of the things that I I had uh, with the solar panel company, which was Solterra, by the way. I didn't mention their name. Oh. S O L T E R R A. Um, I had them put enough solar panels on the roof so that I had the capacity to do electric car charging uh, for the future. I don't have an electric car now, but I had them. Uh, I think they put in four more panels for the for the uh, fact that I will eventually have an electric car, and so that they've got that capacity there. So, yeah, yeah I was hoping a... to bring it up at the next planning committee meeting because when you only mention to a few people, I think I think people need to start thinking about that, like groups of people and not just a few people to maybe hopefully put something like that on, like increase the number of, of um, 
charging or electrical outlets, char chargers for electrical vehicles um, in buildings, especially um, apartment buildings and um, public facilities, but it takes so long to charge. So it's ideal to have people, you know, do it at their homes, whether apartments or homes. Yeah, that's a that's a great debate of the whether or not the uh, the infrastructure can even handle it. Right. I mentioned that I was concerned because I was very concerned about the infrastructure, and someone said the electric companies have it all under control and they're very indignant about it. But which means that they might not. Usually, when there's a lot of motion, that means <laughs> yeah. And so that's why electric panels are really important. And you know, electric panels maybe on top of like wide open parking lots, like you know, grocery store parking lots, um, solar panels, not all the way in nature where you know the transmission reduces the amount that we actually get. And also it can harm, it could cause um, environmental, um, ecological issues like burn animals and, you know, stuff like that when it's out in nature. So ideally on buildings or in parking lots, um, solar panels or homes, you know, that's ideal. Thank you. It was interesting driving to Texas. There are areas in uh, Colorado and, and New Mexico and and Texas itself, where there are miles and miles of solar arrays and uh, and windmills through Central Texas, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of windmills. And as we drove through the middle of the night, every windmill has a red light on it that flashes, and it seemed like there were flashes everywhere the eye could see. It was really incredible. So. That part I like when they own, have birds. their own power grid down there and they they got to do something to keep it going. They got to do something. Yep. I'm so. sorry about the birds I, getting killed by those windmills. Although we, I don't want them to take down existing ones, but there's a lot of birds that are killed. And we have a dwindling number of birds. The, the dams are a great idea, but they kill the salmon. The windmills are a great idea, but they kill birds, you know. Everything has an action and a reaction, and so it has to. We <clears throat> anyway. That's that's my soapbox for tonight. Sorry, uh, Diane, it's, you had your yeah. Hand. I have, it's a little bit of a different topic. Maybe I wasn't here last month, so I don't know if you heard it. But um, you know, Marla and a couple of a bunch of us are working on that Milwaukee forest that's uh, built being built at Shoreline. Has did everybody hear that it got funded and it. The planting date is October 9th. So maybe you all heard that. But no, I didn't hear that. Yeah, it actually, it's really, really fairly recent news, but the, some funding came through and all of a sudden we're moving fast to get, get it set. So December 9th is the official planting date and they'll be you'll be hearing more and more as over the month we're doing a lot of how we're going to outreach and different things like that. We'll need about 100 people to do some planting and that's to build um, a little urban forest right behind the Charlotte Historical Museum over in one part of the that big um, field behind the Charlotte Historical Museum. But wow. it's pretty exciting. I will tell you, we were out at the meeting and the day we heard it was funded, it was like, because we thought it was going to be about a year away. And then I was like, the funding came, they were like, what? You know, <laughs> so that means a lot of work fast. So it's exciting, but, and we'll need people to do some planting. And um, if you want to that that day, We'll have shifts of people and things like that. So it, it takes, I think they said 80 to 100 people. And I don't know, it's kind of wild, but it's a happy what The weather's like that day, right? Yeah, I was hoping <laughs> yeah. I think last year there was snow that weekend. So I'm like, oh, I don't know, but I don't, we don't have a choice yet. <laughs> I think oh. that's it. Hopefully no. Are there flyers that we can post? Uh, not at the moment. There will, there'll be stuff around We're it's really, really only the last couple of weeks and we have another meeting tomorrow. So, you know, it's, it's there's, there's a lot going to happen really fast, but you know, there was some details to work out. So. And you say it's December 9th. Well, that's the, that's the planting day. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Last I heard. So, but you'll be seeing about it. We'll be sending you something, Diane, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Sally will for sure. Yeah, I know. It's pretty exciting, though. It's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it looks like you're actually <laughs> doing it. <laughs> I know. You're like, a good news. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. 
Good, oh, good and one other, one other thing I just have to say to Patrick, I don't know how, I don't have your email. Where'd you go? Is Patrick still there? Oh, there he is. I, have you been to Japan to see all the toilets in Japan, the public toilets? We I thought about not, you. I have not, but there's going to be a movie. I um, can hardly wait in January on the toilet cleaner in Tokyo called Perfect Days. Uh, it's a, they, they've <laughs> released it. I mean, it's in. it's been in a few film festivals. I tried to go to the it was in Lincoln Center in New York, but Claudia wouldn't let me fly to New York to say, <laughs> oh, no. it's going to oh, be released here in a couple months, I think. Oh, that's so great. Perfect well, days. Okay. Okay. Well, I will tell you, we had a chance to get to be two and a half weeks in Japan, and oh. we, I thought of you a lot. The bathroom, <laughs> public bathrooms, are, they're so amazing. They're so clean. They're so everything. I mean, every time you go in one, you can't believe it. So thought of you a lot i mean I tell you. <laughs> did you take pictures <laughs> i have some pictures good <laughs> okay hey, joe what about you <laughs> anything to say to us hi there i noticed you un unmasked yourself i did <clears throat> um i could talk a little bit about pv solar and electric car charging so that's what um I'm in construction, electrical construction, work for Vecca Electric, and we're based out of Seattle. But so currently, the for new construction in Seattle, there's already requirements uh, in Washington State in general. There's already requirements of a certain amount of wattage per square foot of construction that that buildings are required to put on their rooftop for solar. So it's I think it's two and a half watts per foot currently. Um, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if every single building has to do it, it, it adds up pretty quick. Uh, the alternative is you can pay into a, like a state fund to build solar arrays. And usually that's, uh, it's a little bit more cost effective for the owners to just pay into the state fund. Because if you're building megawatts and megawatts of solar field, it's a whole lot more efficient to do than building, you know, say, 80 80 kilowatts on top of a 40 story structure. It's very, very challenging to do that. So there's a little bit of solar already in and then uh, Washington state is set up to adopt the new energy code. They were supposed to do it October 30th, but it looks like it got pushed out to February of 24. Uh, and that'll double the amount of solar required for all new construction. So, um, so if somebody's thinking about that piece, uh, as far as EV charging, the the current energy code has requirements on all new construction for, I think it's 10% of spaces currently either have to have provisions for future EV charging or chargers installed. And when the new, um, the new energy code is adopted, it'll be 10% have to be installed day one, 20 percent additional have to be provisioned in full so that would be conduit and wire and then another like 25 percent is conduit only so um there's definitely a really big push to get the infrastructure in place um there's a lot of the uh, challenges for the whether the state infrastructure can support it the the way the national electric code reads now there's very little variances that electrical engineer can take based on load and when that stuff's going to hit and probably for good reason because most people are going to be charging when they arrive home at night and and if you have that load hit the system it could uh, create some capacity issues so there's a lot of question about that um, even larger uh, problem is the funding you know if as demand rises, funding, private funding is going to increase, but in the last probably 10 years, there hasn't been enough demand to to uh, necessitate private investment. With the Infrastructure Act coming through, that pumped a ton of government money in, and that should be kind of disseminating its way into the states in the next probably five to six months, so you might actually see some um, new EV installations pop up. There's a there's a lot of contractors that are at least keeping a pulse on what that work looks like. So that's coming. Um, and then just like every other industry, the utilities are really strapped for uh, 
large scale distribution equipment. So large scale transformers are two and three years for Seattle City Light and PSC to get their hands on that kind of stuff. So they've they've got their own challenges in front of them for what the infrastructure looks like over the next decade for sure. All the talent we have in this group. <laughs> Right. It's just headaches for me all day, every day. I've been, <laughs> it was a mad dash from June until October 30th where everybody was trying to get in for permits so they wouldn't have to do all this extra work. And now you, know, you get a breather, but that just means we reset and everybody's going to be pushing through the holiday season to try to get in before February 20th. So what about battery technology, Joe? Are they um, planning any battery um, technologies to handle that, that, surge when everyone plugs in the, in the evening their electric vehicles it's it's not there i mean long story short the the size for the amount of storage is uh it's just not tenable you'd be better off not better off it, it would take a ton of fossil fuel to do it but just pumping more kilowatts into the system would be a more efficient way to do it the batteries you would need like buildings and buildings of battery size storage until um, you know, ev is helping because toyota's kind of working on this solid state battery and different different organizations are trying to figure out how to increase the capacity and that'll be the next you know billion dollar idea if you can get megawatts of storage into a small package um, yeah. that that'll be a game changer if each um, commercial building had batteries, would that help? So um, just one central? I mean, it would help, but you would be, uh, just for example, like lighting, which is very efficient at this point because it's mostly LED, especially in all, all new construction. Even to battery backup lighting for any meaningful amount of time, you get into pretty significant footprints. Um, to do that like backing up a network system we we usually talk in terms of minutes rather than anything else so if you're buying battery storage you're buying what's the minimum amount of minutes you can get between two and 11 minutes to carry you over to a generator and depending on how much the demand is you can still have battery racks that are you know 10 feet long by six feet tall by five feet deep just to just to carry those loads Derek, if you're talking, you're muted. There we go. That helps. Boy, everybody was hoping I wouldn't find that button. Uh, <laughs> the, I just going to mention, uh, part of the issue with City Light uh, ownership of the property that I've been working on is one of the reasons they say they don't want to see anything happen there is because they could conceivably put an EV charging station there. Now, anybody who knows that neighborhood would say, why there? Because it's uh, the, the road is, they shrunk the road 10 years ago, and it would just be that much more of a problem. But it does show me that City Light, uh, which, which, you know, they are the kings around here, is thinking that way. That they're going to have to have more chargers, and it's going to have to be more chargers in more neighborhoods. So any property that they do own, that might explain why they're sitting on it so tightly because they don't want to give it up. They see the dollar signs too. They, oh they, yeah. They, they're yeah. projecting what they're going to get in the next two years. They they also never give up property because they never get it back. Right. They're, like yeah. the, they're like the railroad. You have a corridor. You don't give up an inch of property. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, remember that, that right away was established in in 1911 as the interurban the interurban railway. So um, it will never you, you can never get parcels like that again. So all right, um, it's uh, 8:46. Uh, it was a good discussion. I appreciate that. everybody who spoke. Thank you. Um, I guess do if we don't have anything else, we could end 15 minutes early. I think that would be all right. 
I think it was fun that we had this wonderful unannounced second topic. Yeah. <laughs> with all of these experts and experience. This, you never know what's going to happen. That's right. It's a great I have a question. You guys have talked about a couple of times, like your previous fundraising efforts in the book sale. And um, okay. it seems like a lot of your efforts got stymied during COVID. Is that... Is that like so? It just needs a new champion for those things to happen, or is there still some community trepidation to participation, or what's the what's the outlook there? Well, I, I know Diane's got a pretty good handle on what happens or what's happening within the city, and um, you know, we we've talked about um, in person meetings again, and that's just not happening. It does. I don't want to. Part of it, I think, is support from the city, also. Yeah, we're I, we're not. They're they're dis. From what I understand, they're disbanding the council of neighborhoods, and uh, the things that they used to give us money for, we have to partner with somebody else before they'll give us money, and it just plus our volunteers we don't have the volunteers that were doing those those pretty labor intensive events however what we do have is a partnership with the senior center they have offered us their space anytime we want to use it when they don't have something else scheduled and i would love for us to plan some sort of just lightweight informal gathering there so people yeah. could get together so what we really need right now is somebody to say, oh, boy, that sounds great. I want to do that. And then, you know, let them go talk to the senior center and find out what we need to do. And, you know, we could do cookies and coffee. We don't have to do a full dinner, just something for people to spend some time together. And, you know, maybe tap dance or something. <laughs> they have all kinds of interesting things at the senior center. <laughs> <laughs> they could probably help us with that, but that's kind of where we're at. And as far as the money, um, the book sale was pretty labor intensive too, but, uh, and, and a lot of neighborhoods were involved. So what we mostly did was collect tons and tons and tons of books right. and hold them in and have volunteers that worked there. And, and we got about 90, 125 bucks out of it, which for us is a lot of money because yeah. we just don't do expensive events. So that does hurt that we're not getting that. The other money we were getting was from having public meetings and just sort of a putting out the, a pass the hat kind of thing. Yeah. So we'd get 15, 20 bucks each meeting and every once in a while somebody would come up and hand Dale a hundred dollar bucks, you know? Yeah. At but, least half of it made it into the books, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh we watch him like a hawk <laughs> i'm not going to jail for 175 <laughs> that that. defrauding <laughs> a charitable organization yeah if i'm going so, to jail it's for more than a million <laughs> yeah we ain't got it <laughs> yeah so yeah. having a little income coming in because we do have it just expenses like the paying for the domain names for the website silly things like that the real unsexy background stuff that costs oh, money are in right. not in corporation but you know some of our legal stuff yeah we buy zoom yeah know. yeah yeah well the, the other things we've done in the past has uh, been part of the focal point for many grants and things from the city um so that people could put together projects under our bailiwick and then we could get a small amount of funding for those projects uh, dance more pathway king in that way um that that's st structurally is changing quite a bit i think in the yeah. uh, the way the city's organizing itself yeah it is uh, the, the neighborhood associations were hit really strongly by covid and uh, so a lot of that structure that they used to rely on is is kind of going away so they're trying to re-envision re how that's going to happen uh, yeah, I think our our last live meeting was uh, probably January of 2020. Mm -hmm. Right before everything hit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, so, uh, the olden days. But, you know, people have donated and people on the screen right now have donated. And, you know, we certainly, I certainly appreciate that. And 
And, uh, you know, the, we don't have cooking expenses anymore. That's true. Well, we could, <laughs> That's we true. could go for pay-per-view. <laughs> yeah. yeah there you go. But the mongers, somehow, right? <laughs> the mongers did put on a free picnic mm -hmm. um, and bought the food and cooked and served about 100 people uh, because um, the mongers applied for a grant from the from the uh, Council of Neighborhoods. And if that money is gone, that those kinds of, you know, it, it wasn't a huge grant, but it helped us to put on an event. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was probably, if it was around $400 a year Yeah, that the city reimbursed our, our picnic expenses. They, yeah, they basically paid for the whole thing. Of course, you realize a lot of that was that Jeannie was such an incredible shopper. Oh, yeah. And she was getting the best bargain on everything. I never, you know, I always said it was like loaves of fishes. Never figured out how she managed to feed so many people on so little money. And we always had food left over. Right. And true, Larry, you guys were always hauling it over to the Veterans Center. Oh, yeah. But I, I learned a couple of those tricks, but not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, good. Does that mean you're cooking now? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, things are changing in you know, in the neighborhoods associations and yeah. Well, we will keep on doing what we do, and uh, if we need yeah. money for things, I guess we'll figure out how to get it. Can I stand on the street corner with a cup? Sometimes just sometimes just asking, you know, at the right yeah. time for the right reason is all you have to do. Yeah. And uh, Ginny was not bashful about doing that either. <laughs> no, she wasn't. No. Nope. Yeah, but we're okay right this minute. Good. But yeah, I think another concern is just always um, gaining new members and people who are participating. And, you know, we used to have 30, 35 people in our in house meetings. So. Well. Maybe not quite that many, but yeah, we lost a lot of people that came to in-person meetings. They just don't want to do Zoom. Yeah. But the, the advantage for us, of course, is that uh, we have a board member who's in Europe right now, and she still was communicating with us. She didn't want to try to come into the Zoom meeting, but and yeah. another member has uh, is, spends half of his time in Birch Bay but he still actively participates. So we could do these things because we were all online. We have our board meetings online all, always. Yeah. And that's such an advantage. Don't want to give up that advantage. Yeah. So, so pivot. Absolutely. We got to pivot. All right. Well, we probably should uh, close this, uh, this fun meeting down. I appreciate all, all of you being here. I got a scoot. Okay. Good to, good to well, see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice seeing you all. Thank you for Thank coming. You all.